This video is part of a series on the XV6 operating system kernel. In this video, I'm going to introduce the main function and talk a little bit about the startup procedure. Before that, I'm going to go over the file organization and uh, I'll end by going over a couple of small files that uh, we can take care of quickly. Let's begin with the files that are included with the XV6 system. Uh, here I've listed out all of the files. So you can see there are not too many of them. The organization is pretty straightforward. You've got two directories, kernel and user. These are the files that are in the kernel directory. Basically, it's just a bunch of C code files, some header files. There are several assembly language files. Uh, there's entry.s, which I'll discuss base a little bit. Uh, kernel vac, uh, there is switch.s, very interesting one, and uh, trampoline.s. Uh, there's also initcode.s. Uh, there's also a file here that's used by the linker uh, but that's as well. Uh, in the user directory, you have the code for the initial process as well as the code for the user application programs, the shell and user mode programs like cat, echo, and so on. So in addition, uh, you've got a make file to build all these files, and you've got a readme and a, a license file. So it's pretty straightforward organization. The x 6 system runs on a multi-core computer, and when it begins, each core will start executing all at once. They all begin at the same time. It's a shared memory system, so all cores will share the exact same memory, and they will all begin executing the same exact code. And that code is in a file called entry.s. It's not a very long file, just a few lines. And that code will then transfer control to a C function called start in the file start.c, and that will then transfer control to the main function. The assembly code that's in the entry file basically uh, gets things set up so that we can execute C programs. It will initialize the stack pointer register, the SP register, and it will initialize the TP register. Each core will uh, share main memory, so they will be uh, accessing the same set of global variables, but each core will need its own stack. They can't overlap, that wouldn't work at all. So there's a separate stack space for each of the cores, and the code in entry.s will uh, initialize the stack pointer register for the core appropriately. Also, there's a TP register that stands for thread pointer, but the TP register actually will contain the core number, the number of the core, 0, 1, 2, or so on, instead of some sort of a thread pointer. And that register will stay constant on that core throughout. So that allows the code to ask at any time, what core am I running on? So once those are set up, uh, we transfer control to the start function. In another video, I talk about the different modes that the RISC-V processor can execute in. It can execute in machine mode, supervisor mode, and user mode. The, all of the kernel runs in supervisor mode, except for a tiny bit of code, which is in this start.c file. And that so initially, when the system begins execution, uh, it begins executing in machine mode, and the code here will take care of a few bookkeeping things and then switch to supervisor mode, and the cores will remain in supervisor mode after that. Okay, now let's take a look at the main function. Here is the code for main.c. It's not very long, and it contains nothing more than the main function. So let's see what happens. Remember that 
each core will begin executing this code in parallel. So they're, all cores will begin with this if statement. CPU ID is a short function that basically looks at and returns the value of the TP register. So on core zero, this function will return zero, and core zero will then execute this code here. All other cores will execute this code here instead. So what does the code do? Well, core zero is tasked with initializing things. So you see a lot of calls to init, init, init this, init that, and init some other stuff. It also prints out this message that uh, the kernel is booting. There is a global variable or a shared variable here. It's in the memory space, so of course all cores will have access to it. And it's used for synchronization. This keyword here, volatile, is a little bit of C magic that uh, says that this variable is used for uh, synchronization possibly by multiple cores or concurrent threads. And it is, in fact, used to control the uh, begin, beginning of the other cores. So it is initialized to zero or false, if you will. And once core zero is done initializing, it will change it to true. All the other cores go into this tight loop where they're testing it. And they keep testing until it is found to be true. And then they execute this code here. And they start out by printing heart something starting. The term heart is synonymous with core, at least for these videos. And so basically it's saying core one is starting, core two is starting, and so on. And they are pulling up their own core or CPU ID right here. The last thing that core zero does is it starts the code for the init process. So that's what's going on here. And then it sets started to one, and then the other, pro the other cores will do some initialization here. KM init, trap init, click init. These are per core initialization things, and they happen in core zero as well. K KVM init, uh, trap init, and click init happen here for core zero. Once all of that happens on all of the cores, each core will then call the scheduler function. And what scheduler will do is we'll look for a process to execute. So at that point, all the cores will start executing processes. We also see this sync synchronize uh, function here. This is, again, a little bit of compiler magic. Compilers will try to optimize things. And what this is doing is telling the compiler to chill out and not do that optimization. The compiler might uh, rearrange code in order to try to achieve greater performance and efficiency. What the synchronize does is tell the compiler Make sure you finish everything above it first before you start anything after it. So it's saying, please finish all of this initialization before you change this variable to one. You may not be able to understand what I'm doing here, you're saying to the compiler, but I'm telling you, you need to finish doing every single thing above this before you think about changing that variable to one. Likewise, down here, uh, it's telling the compiler the same thing. Don't start executing this stuff until you have completed this while loop here. Okay, there are um, several small files that uh, I want to take a quick look at and get these out of the way. Types.h contains just these type defs here. You're probably familiar with uh, these abbreviations for familiar types. So on the architecture we're using, the RISC-V architecture with the tool chain, it's a 64-bit machine. Integers will be 32 bits. Um, so we define unsigned 8-bit values, unsigned 16-bit values, unsigned 32-bit values, and unsigned 64-bit values. We use this type uint64 quite a bit for addresses and pointers. 
Okay, next file I want to look at is param.h. There are a number of things that are hard-coded into the kernel. So let me just go through these quickly. In proc, the maximum number of processes is just set to 64. The number of cores is 8. Then you have other things. The number of open files, the number of open files per system, number of inodes, number of devices, the device number, root dev, max argument. Uh, this is the maximum number of arguments that you can have on, a, on an exec system call. Uh, max op blocks, log size, inbuff, fs size, max path. That's the maximum number of characters in a file's path name. Finally, I want to look at a file called def.h. And this uh, is listed out here on these four pages, so you can see what's going on. But basically, this is just for the compiler. It contains a, a bunch of uh, function prototypes. So for example, uh, the file console.c contains uh, at least these three functions, which might be used in, in other files as well. So this is basically... Uh, uh, just the function prototypes. There's nothing much of interest here. We'll encounter all these files later, so let's go through all these pages. On the last page, there is um, a preprocessor macro. Perhaps you've seen this in other contexts, but this is the number of elements, and you would have uh, a variable here and an array variable. And what it does is it just asks, how big is the entire array? and how big is a single element, and it just gives you the number of elements. Okay, that's it for this video. I'll see you in the next video.